Let it be now, I pray. In the name of Amen. Amen. You may be seen. I want to invite your attention tonight to two passages of Scripture. The first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And the second is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. God bless Mother Spencer coming in. That first passage of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 1, says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. May the Lord add a blessing to his already blessed word. I want to focus your attention tonight on two key words in these two passages. The first word is ministry in 2 Corinthians 4 and 1. And the second word is minister in 1 Peter 4 and 10. I also want to focus your attention on that word handling in 2 Corinthians 4 and 1. With these key words in mind, I want to use for a subject tonight, mishandling ministry matters. Mishandling ministry matters. I don't know about you, but I am one that believes that ministry is not reserved or restricted for the ministers. I believe that ministry is not rated P for preachers only, but E for everybody. I believe that we all have a calling. And that we are all called to ministry. Now, that's going to be a little different than what you're used to. Because, you know, when I was coming up in the church, there were, you know, just certain ones that were said, it was said to them, oh, you, there's a call on your life. There's a call. I can see a call on your life. <laughs> well, we all have a call on our life. And we're all called to ministry. I believe that we all have a work to do. And that work is the work of the ministry. Amen. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, um, verse 8, about the ascension of Jesus Christ. He says that when he ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men. Yes. Then he goes on in the 11th verse. To say, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. The next verse, verse 12 says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Notice here how the ministers were given the responsibility of, of uh, perfecting the saints for the work of the ministry. We usually think of those three things there as three separate things, but the, it's really one thing. It's the perfecting of the saints so that the, the uh, saints can be uh, prepared for the ministry so that the body of Christ can be edified. So the ministers were not given to do all the work of the ministry. No, they were given to perfect or equip the saints 
for the work of the ministry. This says to me that, then that the saints have a ministry. Come on, say, I have a ministry. You may not have a title, but you got a ministry. You may not have a position, but you have a ministry. And if you really want to know the truth about it, the ministry of the saints is not that different than the ministry of the ministers. We may have different gifts, different offices, and therefore different functions, but we all have the same ministry. Are you listening to me tonight? Our opening text says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry. The writer is a minister, but he doesn't say, therefore, seeing I have this ministry. He's talking to the church. The epistle is addressed to the saints at Corinth. Hallelujah. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. So we are all recipients of the same ministry. And that ministry is the ministry of Jesus Christ. The ministry that we have received and are engaged in is the ministry that Jesus delegated to the church. The whole church. Jesus told his disciples, and you excuse, well, I shouldn't really apologize for this, but uh, I usually don't give any less than 10 uh, verses of scripture in a, in a message. So I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures tonight. My pastor was a teacher, and so I'm just used to giving people, not just reading one scripture and say, shut your Bible, but keep it open because I'm going to give you a lot of more scriptures. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus told his disciples in John 14, verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. The works that Jesus did were the works associated with his ministry. And if we are believers... We are to carry on those same works. Huh? We're to carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Mark talks about that. In Mark 16, and these signs shall follow them that believe. And so if you're a believer, then you have a part in the ministry. Like the followers of Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, we must all have a mind to work. Like Jesus, our attitude should be, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. For night comes when no man can work. That's in John chapter 9, verse 4. In Luke 2, 49, at the age of 12, Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. That should be our attitude. In other words, we got to get serious about the work of the ministry. We don't have a lot of time to waste. We got to do what God has called us to do and do it quickly. It's getting late in the evening and the sun is going down. Jesus is on his way back. And when he comes, we are going to have to give an account of what we have done with the ministry he gave us. Like the servants in the parable of the talents. Matthew chapter 25, we are stewards who must give account of our stewardship. That word steward is found in 1 Peter 4 and 10, one of the two scriptures in our opening. Peter says that we're to use the gifts God has given us in the ministry. We're to take our God-given gifts and minister with them. Minister with them. People are doing all kinds of things with their gifts. I, the one thing that I really hate is many are prostituting their gifts. I'm going to leave that alone. We're supposed to not prostitute our gifts, but minister with our gifts as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We must also be faithful stewards. For 1 Corinthians... 
4, verse 2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So it's not enough just to be good. Huh? You must be good and faithful. As we learn in the parable of the talents, you can be a good and faithful servant or you can be a wicked and slowful servant. I don't know about you, but I want to be the good and faithful servant. How many of y'all want to be good and faithful? Thank you, Jesus. If you do, you better heed the words of this message that I'm bringing you tonight. You better watch how you handle the grace of God. Watch how you handle the gifts and callings of God. Watch how you handle the anointing. Thank God for the bishop coming in. Hallelujah. Watch how you handle the ministry of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 says, Whatsoever thy hands find to do, huh? Do it with thy might. Do it with thy might. Whatsoever thy hands, thy hands <laughs> find to do, do it. I think one of the major problems in the body of Christ today is that we mishandle the things of God. And that's why my title is Mishandling Ministry Matters. Houston, we got a problem. We got some things going on in these local churches that should not be going on. People are mishandling the ministry of Jesus Christ. They're doing stuff in the name of ministry for the sake of ministry that are not holy, that are not godly, <laughs> that are not biblical. Are y'all here tonight? Mm, mm, mm. You see, the things of God are not to be trifled with. They're not to be treated as trivial things. They're not to be looked upon as something that has little or no importance, significance, or value. They're not to be lightly regarded. The things of God are not lightweight things. They are heavy. They are weighty things. And it's not enough. And if that's not enough, the things of God are also holy things. Somebody shout holy. You don't trifle with holy things. You don't mess around with holy things. You don't play with holy things. You don't treat holy things like you treat worldly things. You must always maintain a distinction between the holy and the unholy. Am I preaching yet? I think about the way the Philistines handled the Ark of the Covenant in 1 Samuel chapter 5. Verses 2 through 7. I'm not going to read that, but y'all remember the Ark of the Covenant? It was the place where God chose to put his name and to put his glory. So to mishandle the Ark of the Covenant was to mishandle the name of God and to mishandle the glory of God. And this is exactly what the Philistines did. Mm, my God, my God. They had the nerve, the, the, the audacity, the unmitigated gall to take the ark and put it in the temple of one of their idol gods, Dagon. Half man, half a uh, fish. Upper part, man, bottom part, fish. Mm, mm, mm. 
They were pluralistic, not monotheistic. They believed in many gods, although Dagon was their chief god. So they figured this is God, this is the our, this is a, a representation of Israel's God. We just put him over next to our God. The next day they went in there and Dagon was falling on his face. So they stood him back up <laughs> next to the ark. <laughs> now the first time it fell, it fell in front of the ark. Like God said, you better bow down to me. Okay? I don't bow down to you. You bow down to me. They put him back up. Then the next day they went into the temple and lo and behold, Dagon was falling down again, but this time his head was cut off in his hands broken off laying in the doorway oh my god there's some more to that I just don't have time to get into mm, 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 mm. <sighs> in the weigh-ins television show in living color there was a character who would hit people with a stuff sock at the end of a string and say, uh, I'm homie, I don't play that. <laughs> when Dagon was knocked down in his own temple, it was as if God was saying, my name is holy and I don't play that. God was saying, I am holy <laughs> and I don't play that. I am the one and only God. And beside me, there is none other. I'm, I'm getting ready to step into some sensitive areas. And I'm not going to get too specific because somebody might get offended tonight. But you don't miss, mix godly things with ungodly things. You don't take holy things and, and try to stand them up with unholy things. As the oldest saints used to say, I don't know, they may still be saying it, but they used to say, you got to make a difference. They said, you got to make a difference between the clean and the unclean. You got to make a difference between the holy and the unholy. So remember that the next time you are engaged in ministry in the house of the Lord. Don't try to bring worldly things into the church. We are not the world, we are the church. So if we are going to sing, let's keep it holy. If we're going to dance, let's keep it holy. If we're going to rap or, or, or do the mime, let's keep it holy. If we're going to do something different to reach the lost, fine, but let's keep it holy. Am I preaching yet? Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's keep it holy. Come on, tell your neighbor, keep it holy. Amen. I ain't going to mess with y'all singers. I ain't going to mess with y'all favorite singers. <laughs> I ain't going to mess with some of this newfangled stuff. Some of, oh, my God. I was watching television once, gospel, Christian television, and a certain denomination, Pentecostal, was in town at Cobo Hall. And uh, I found out about it, went just checked them out on TV, and they had a, a, a young lady singing, and then they had these guys behind, and they was dancing. And it was really a, a Caucasian lady, and the dancers were African-American. And then they start getting up on her, real close to her, and, and making, and I'm like, what is that? We ain't at the club. This is the church. <laughs> and even if you're not in a church building, you could be in a convention hall. But when, oh my God, when the saints are gathered together, come on, that's a holy assembly. Yes. 
let me stop trying to preach and teach. Let's get back to our text and deal with the specifics of mishandling ministry matters. The Apostle Paul says there in 2 Corinthians 4 and 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Listen, if you're going to be involved in ministry, whether inside the church building or outside the church building, you must be submitted and committed. You can't be fainting. You can't be falling down on the job. You can't be MIA, missing an action, or AWOL, absent without leave. When it's time for church, can't nobody find you. You can't be here today and gone tomorrow. My pastor taught me the Christian race is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's not about how fast you can run. It's how long you can last. So that means you have to have some stamina. You got to have some endurance. You got to have some perseverance. You got to have some resilience. Proverbs 24 and 10 says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. So you must have strength. Tell your neighbor, you got to have some strength. Tell your neighbor, you got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Hallelujah, for we are now living in a day where only the strong are going to survive. You got time for weak saints. You got to be strong. Tell your neighbor you got to be strong. You got to be strong enough to make it to the end. You must have enough strength to cross the finish line. What those saints used to sing? 99 and a half won't do. You got to make 100. Help me preach. Tell your neighbor you got to make 100. Move down to verse 2. The Apostle Paul really gets down to the nitty-gritty of the matter in verse 2. He really goes into detail about mishandling ministry matters. The first thing he talks about is renouncing mm, the hidden things of dishonesty. The New Living Translation says we reject all shameful and underhanded methods. The New International Version says we have renounced secret and shameful ways. Shouldn't be having no secret meetings in the church. Parking lot meetings in the church. Private meetings in your house concerning the church and the pastor don't know nothing about it. Oh Lord, hallelujah. Where that musician at? He may have to bail me out today. Kentucky Fried Chicken has a commercial that says, we do chicken right. If we're going to do ministry, let's do it right. I said, let's do it right. Let's not bring the ways of the world into the ministry. Let's not do stuff that's secretive, shameful, or underhanded. My God, I'm telling you, I've been in this thing a long time now. I've seen all kinds of stuff. Can I share with you real briefly one, one case? You've heard of church splits, but have you ever heard of a pastor split in his own church? I knew a man of God that was having marital difficulty. He went to his bishop. His bishop told him, reconcile with your wife or resign. He chose to resign the church. But before he gave it up, he started having private, secret meetings with some of the top tithers in the church and making plans to start another church. I saw this church grow from a couple of hundred, two or three hundred people to five hundred and then to a thousand people. 
The last time I had preached in that church, amen, they, the, the, the sanctuary, the floor was filled, then they had a balcony, it was filled with people. And this man was really willing to give it up rather than do what was right. So he left and he took some people and he started another church, but it didn't prosper. <laughs> Give you another story. Several years ago, I was helping a pastor to remodel his church. Our church was in a building fund drive, and we were a little short, and we needed some more money. So we decided to sow into his church, believing God to bless us as well as them. Well, the remodeling took place, and we were all pleased with the final outcome. But later on, I learned that the pastor had gotten a hookup with the church's electricity. For those of you that may not know what I mean when I say a hookup, <laughs> their electrical power was not accessed legally. <laughs> the pastor, you know... <laughs> Needs to say they was located in the hood. So they, he knew somebody that could get them a hookup. <laughs> Make a long story short, a few years later, that pastor died and the congregation did too. This was not all that surprising because you can't do stuff underhandedly and expect God to bless you and prosper you. God does not bless mess. Tell your neighbor, don't be a messy thing. Ah, yeah, yeah. If you want to endure, you got to be pure. Somebody help me preach tonight and say, if you want to be pure. Oh, my God. If you want to endure, you got to be pure. Keep your nose clean. Keep your hands clean. Hallelujah. Handle your business legally. I said legally. Hallelujah. If you don't, you may find yourself a prisoner with a prison ministry. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> the next thing Paul says is not walking in craftiness. You don't have to do things in a crafty way. You don't have to be sly. You don't have to be slick. See, people, some people, they come out the world, they was that way in the world. Then they come in the church, they get saved, but they still got their worldly ways. They were sneaky in the world, now they sneaky in the church. So private, don't want nobody to know nothing. Not even let them know if you're sick. And then if you have to go to the hospital and nobody calls or come, but then you get mad at the church. Talking about nobody called me. And nobody came by to visit me. But you so private and sneaky, not wanting people to know anything about you, never communicated where we could respond. Jesus. You don't have to be deceptive, cunning, or shrewd like Jacob was in the Old Testament. Sooner or later, behavior like that will catch up with you. You will reap. Oh, my God. Then Paul saying, in Galatians, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's why these elders that want to become pastors better be careful how they handle themselves in the house of God. Glory to God. Because how you treat your pastor, come on. And how people going to treat you when you become a pastor. Oh, Lord. Uh, 
Learn how to be open and honest with people. Be forthright with folk. Be beating around the bush all the time. Just get to it. Tell the truth. And shame the devil. Because the devil is a liar. So if we lying, then we take on his nature. Don't say one thing and then do another. Give people your word and by all means, keep your word. Oh, God, help me. The next thing Paul says is not handling the word of God deceitfully. There are a lot of people who do stuff that's not right and then use the Bible to justify it. For example, they get married, then get a divorce on grounds that the Bible says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. They interpret and argue that they can get a divorce because the Lord didn't put them together. <laughs> Preacher said, whom the Lord put together. The Lord didn't put us together. We just, put our, we just got together. We wasn't put together. The Lord. That's not rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what you call distorting the word of God. That's what you call twisting the scriptures. That's what you call reading into a text and making it say what you want it to say. God forbid. Another problem related to mishandling the word of God is teaching and preaching with the wrong motives. Paul had a problem with this in his day. He had his share of haters. He had people who were in competition with him. There were people preaching and teaching, but they were doing it out of a spirit of jealousy and envy. Mm. In Philippians 1.15, he says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. Then in the next verse, he goes on to say, The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. We have people like this today. We have people who are ministering with the wrong motive. We have preachers preaching for fortune and fame. We have teachers who are teaching in an effort to out-teach somebody else uh, to show them that, 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 that they are deeper than them. We had a woman of God. She's well known now. In the early years, we invited her to our church. And... Uh, she knew, you know, she's in a college town, you know, she's got a pastor, pastor, college educated. So she didn't want to come in with nothing too simple or basic. So she called herself being deep and told my members <laughs> that Lucifer was the worship, praise and worship uh, angel in heaven. And when he sent and got kicked out of heaven, it left a void in heaven. Then she said, this is why we must praise and worship God. Because if we don't, God is going to start missing Lucifer. I thought I had trained my members better than that, but they were sitting there talking about, ooh, wow. I was so mad, hallelujah. <laughs> That following Sunday had to get up and tell the saints, ain't no way in the Bible that tells us we better praise and worship God because if we don't, he's going to start missing Lucifer. Find that spirit of error. I said, the Bible tells us why we should praise him. We should praise him for he is good and his mercy endures forever. I said, ain't no way God is going to be missing Lucifer because he's got thousands of angels that bow before him. He's got 20 and 4 elders. He's got peace around the throne. And day and night, and night and day, they're bowing before 
before. Come on, somebody. And if you don't praise him, the rocks. Come on. Am I in the book? <laughs> Sit down. I'm going to come to my conclusion. as well as people in the pulpit. Lay people ministering with their own motives. Some want the praises of men. They do just what they do what they do just to get somebody to pat them on the back. Say, you so wonderful. We love you. We appreciate you. We thank you. How many know Jesus said, when you have done, when you are servant and do what the master says, Oh, my God. It is just your reasonable service. Ain't nothing to get all up, up you know. Let me close. Let me tell you why this is so important. And why these things shouldn't be that we just talked about. They rob the gospel. And I'm going to get to the theme now, Elder Scotty. They rob the gospel of his power. They cause the people of God to end up with a form of God. But denying the power thereof. Let me show you what I'm talking about. My last scripture. Psalms 8 and 6. Thou madest him to have dominion. There go your scripture. Your word. Dominion. God made man to have dominion over the works of his hands. And he's put all things under our feet. God made you to have dominion. Somebody say dominion. In other words, he made you to have authority. He made you to have power. He made you to command things and call those things that be not as though they were. But when you disobey God, when you disobey these two texts that I read at the beginning, when you mishandle ministry matters, when you fail to be a good steward of the ministry God has given you, your dominion is diminished. Your authority and power is diminished. Your ability to command and control things is diminished. So you end up like the sons of Sceva who tried to cast out demons but were unsuccessful and got beat up by those very same demons. You end up like Samson who shook himself not knowing that the power of the Lord had lifted up off of him. Hallelujah. But the good news is, I said the good news is that Samson prayed and repented and got his power back. His hair grew back. And his power was restored. And if we could just get Samson to come back and testify tonight, I believe his testimony would be this. In a sentence, concerning the power of God, I had it, I lost it, but I got it back. If we could move to the Old Testament, Luke chapter 15, and get some more witnesses. Hallelujah. If we could get the woman who lost the coin, hallelujah, to testify. Her testimony would be, I had it, I lost it, but I got it back. If we could call the shepherd that lost one sheep to come and testify tonight, I believe his testimony would be, I had it, I lost it, but I got it back. If we could call the father of the lunatic son, of the, of the prodigal son, hallelujah, to testify tonight, he would testify, I believe, I had him, I lost him, but I got him back. Hallelujah. Oh my God, I shut down. If you do what Samson did, I believe you can have the same kind of testimony. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. 
If you ever lose the dominion of God, the power of or the authority that God has given you to do ministry, make up in your mind that you're going to be like Samson. Hallelujah. And, 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 and that you will possess what the New Testament uh, 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 examples I just gave you what they possess. Make sure, make sure that you make this confession though. I had it. I lost it. But I'm going to get it back. I'm going to get it back. I'm going to get it back. Devils ain't leaving when I call, when I call them out. Sickness ain't being healed when I'm praying and laying hands. I've lost something, but I want to get that back. Power to heal the sick. Power to cast out devils. Power to be a witness for my Lord. Somebody say yes. Come on and say yes. Say yes. Hallelujah. I'm going to say that. But this is the story of the whole Bible. This is the gospel. This is why Jesus came in the book of Genesis and he gave man dominion. Hallelujah. But Adam and Eve lost that dominion when they sinned in the Garden of Eden. Hallelujah. But Jesus came. Hallelujah. And died on the cross for our sins. He died, yes, that you might have salvation, but he also died that you might have restoration, that, hallelujah, the dominion that was lost in the fall will be restored. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Yeah, I had it. Through Adam, I lost it. But through Jesus, I'm going to get it back. I'm going to get back everything that the devil has stolen from me. Devil, you can't have it. Through my faith in Christ, I'm going to get it back. I'm going to take my place, my place of power, my place of authority. I want to get to that point where I can call those things to be now. As though they were. I can say, peace, be still, and the storm stops. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to sit down. Thank you, Lord. The saints, let's be careful. How we handle ministry matters. We don't want to mishandle. We want to handle them in the way that God would have us to handle them. So much, so much more. I just don't have the time. If you follow up on that story about the Philistines. They took that ark out of the temple, put it somewhere else. Fast forward. Fast forward to when David became king. He went and got the ark back. But the first attempt, he mishandled it. Uzzah went to touch the ark when it was trying, like it was going to fall. He was struck dead. Then David went to studying the word, I believe, studying the instructions that God had given them concerning the ark. And he found, oh, we've been doing it all wrong. We put it on a new cart. We had people trying to touch it. When God instructed, we're supposed to put poles on the side of it where we can lift it on our shoulders. I'm not supposed to touch the ark. Come on. The only people that could really handle it were the, the priests. Thank you, Jesus. So when he corrected himself, hallelujah, they were able to successfully bring the ark back. And with it came blessings. Oh, my God. 
even its temporary place, it was blessed. The people were blessed. What are you trying to say? When you repent like Samson did and you bring yourself in order, then God's blessings start coming. In unusual ways, Jesus. Every head is bowed. I don't know if there are any backsliders here tonight. But if you're a backslider, you need to come back. You know things haven't been better living in sin. Come on back home. I'm not saying come and join this church. I'm saying come back into the fold. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Don't wait and say, well, when I get myself together, then I'm going to come. You'll never get it together. You can't do it by yourself. Without Christ, you can do nothing. Is there one? Come. Come. I'm not going to tell you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Are there any sinners? You want to be saved? Come. Come. Come to Jesus.